All right, everyone, how you doing today? This is uh, class 11, spring 2022, or, uh, Recording Studio Fundamentals, Copeland School of Music, etc., etc., etc. You know, I had a, um, was out walking the dog this morning, and, uh, well, first of all, how is everybody doing? You okay? You get out today, the weather uh, is incredible, actually. It is up here in the Hudson Valley. It's beautiful, warm, sunny. It's just really nice, especially after the events of the past of yesterday, which is really frightening, to be honest with you. Um, but there are a lot of angry people in the world doing angry things. But I was out with the dog this morning, and the thought occurred to me that I graduated from Queens College from undergraduate school 40 years ago this ne in May. And... Um, we had the inaugural concert for the Copeland School of Music 40 years ago. I don't remember whether it was late April, early May. I'm, not, I'm kind of, I don't remember the exact date. I do remember it was in the spring. And I was thinking about it today. And, you know, I haven't heard the orchestra at the college in a few years because I haven't been there in a couple of years due to COVID. But... About five five years ago, four or five years ago, I played piano with the school orchestra. We were doing a benefit for the Marvin Hamlish Scholarship. Marvin, uh, who wrote Chorus Line, movie, felt the way we were, you know, big, big time uh, composer in the 70s, uh, you know, Oscars, etc. He graduated from Queens College. And... Um, He had pay, he was supposed to play piano at this concert, but he had passed away. So I ended up sitting in with the orchestra. And as we were playing through selections from a chorus line and a bunch of his other musicals, you know, I, I a chorus line was a great musical. I'm, you know, not sure how great some of the other stuff he wrote was, he, but he was incredibly successful. And I actually played with the New York Pops at Carnegie Hall, and he was conducting. Um, which is because he was the conductor for a while of the New York Pops. And that was kind of an interesting evening. I got to play with uh, Dee Dee Bridgewater. Um, she sang, which was, uh, that was a great honor. She was uh, too good for me, to be honest with you. But uh, she allowed me to play along while she was singing. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was interesting. But when we were doing the concert, we had at the college in Lafrac Hall, we had um, the Queens College Orchestra, with some a few ringers, some students from the uh, CUNY Grad Center, some doctoral students, you know, in like playing first chair cello and uh, and something else, maybe lead trumpet or something. And I was playing piano. And uh, Doctor Smalldone, I don't know if any of you know him. Uh, he was the department chair at that point. He was playing bass and he sang a couple of numbers. And we had one of the jazz students uh, play drums with us, graduate students. And then there were six six uh, singers who were very close to Marvin who sang with us. Donna McKechnie, who won a Tony Award in a chorus line. Um, J. Mark McVeigh, and I worked with J. Mark McVeigh uh, when I was playing the national tour of Les Miserables in 1990. He was Jean, Jean Valjean and his wife and uh, a, f a few other incredibly good singers and the orchestra you know the music was not easy the arrangements and orchestrations were not easy and the orchestra actually pulled it off and I was really impressed I couldn't imagine when I was an undergraduate student the orchestra being able to pull that off because at the inaugural concert which was in 1982 um we, I was in the chorus, the choir, and we sang uh, in the beginning, which was a, a you know a choral piece of his of Aaron's based on uh, the text from Genesis, and we had a, a mezzo soprano soloist, this this woman named Camille Capasso, who was uh, graduated with me. I don't know what she did with her career after college. I sort of wasn't good friends with her, but she she was a good singer. And we did a passable, the choir did a passable job. You know, we weren't embarrassing. We weren't great, but we, we, we did a good job. The 
orchestra was horrible. Cracking trumpet notes, timpanis coming in in the wrong place, violins out of tune, nothing in time. It sounded, it was, it, was, it was a train wreck. It was really embarrassing because the concert was packed and there was like press uh, from the New York Times and the Daily News and some Queens newspapers. And, you know, there were dignitaries from, uh, you know, they were like, I don't know if the mayor of New York was there at that time. I don't even know who the mayor was in 1982. Was it uh, Abe? I don't think it was Dinkins. I forget who the mayor was back then. Uh, but it, it was it was kind of embarrassing, to be honest with you. And it was even interesting to me is that there were several musicians in the orchestra who were excellent musicians who went on to have careers. I, they're still working as freelancers in the city. Uh, Jack Schatz, a bass trombone player, he still plays on Broadway, does recording sessions. He teaches at SUNY Purchase. Uh, Charlie Gordon, he plays with the Ed Palermo big band. He does shows. Um, he's an excellent trombone player. Meryl Apt, she still freelances playing her clarinet. And Ed Gilmore, who was a close friend of mine, who um, he stopped. He was an incredible clarinet player. He was the best instrumentalist in the college at that time, not, not even a question. And after he, he went to Juilliard and got his master's degree and he played around, then he stopped. But he was. we had some incredible musicians just not enough to carry the orchestra and it was kind of embarrassing anyway after the performance was over they had you know the right next to um the school there's that there's the building that's right next to the school where they've got all the ping pong tables do you know where that is if you've been to the campus that used to be the faculty dining room right uh back then um, so we had a big reception in, and it was all completely open. The two rooms that are now sort of separated were open and that was packed with people in there. And Aaron was seated at a chair, uh, right. Because we didn't even have music building back then. We were in Rathouse Hall and Rathouse Hall is named after Carol Rathouse, K-A-R-O-L, who was one of the founding members of this music college in the late thirties, early forties of, of, of the music department. So, you know, up until this point, we had just been a music department, but then we became what we are now, which is a, a, it's almost like a conservatory inside of the, the, college, the liberal arts college. So we're all waiting online. Somebody drove up to Peekskill to get Aaron. He was very old, very frail, brought him down to the concert. And then after the concert, they took him into this, into that room there where the ping pong tables are now. And he was just seated there and we were all like waiting online and we got to shake his hand and meet him and all this stuff. And I've got this friend of mine named Alan. I'm still, he's still one of my best friends. We were, went to college together and you know, Alan is a little um, irreverent at the time, at times. And he walked up to Aaron Copeland and didn't say, uh, you know, I was like, Oh, Mr. Copeland, it's a, a honor to meet you. We, lo I love your music so much and thank you for coming down and, you know, everybody was being very polite. My friend Alan just walked up to him and said, so, Aaron, how you doing? What do you think of Emerson, Lake, and Palmer's version of Fanfare for the Common Man? And we were all just like, what did you just do? And Aaron just looked up and said, oh, it's not bad. And then he went on to the next person. It was really funny. I mean, much funnier in person. And if you knew my friend Alan, it would be even funnier. But, um, yeah, that's 40 years ago. Time flies when you're having fun, trust me. Pretty soon you're over 60, and then, like, ugh. what happened to all that time between then? Anyway, uh, now and then. So just share that little story, the history of Queens College, Oak Copeland School of Music a little bit. Um, yeah. Okay, so um, we are... Getting one more assignment, which is going to be assigned today. We have a break next week, and I'm assigning the final today. It will be due on May 18th. And let me just uh, go to my screen here. Uh, professor. Yes. Uh, sorry, I have a question. Yeah. I, I couldn't find the uh, folder to submit today's oh, assignment. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I not put one up? Uh -huh. Okay, I'll put one up. Uh, I'll put one up in a minute, and, and then you can just upload it, all right? No problem. Thank you Thank so you much. for letting me know. Thank you. 
Yeah, it's been this past week has been um, a bit of a whirlwind. Uh, I've had so much work. There's people that handed in assignments late that I didn't get to. I will be able to get to it after tomorrow. I'll have free time to go over over the weekend to go over any late assignments. Um, I had to put together. I've been working on this film for ESPN since the music since October I started, and October and November. Uh, it was I wrote a lot of music and then they worked on the film and then in January late January beginning of February well they finished the film they handed it in and ESPN had notes so they had to do a lot of editing I had to work on changing the music making it conform to all the edits and then that was you know I, I think like the first and I was done with that like the beginning of the second week of February and then now they got, okay, Casey, one second. Sure. Yes, that's fine. Yep. Okay, no problem. Um, just remind me, okay, Casey. Uh, so I had to, everything got approved finally. Because what happens is that when you work for these big corporations, there are levels of approval. So I have to write music. It has to get approved by the filmmakers. They submit the film, and the film has to be approved by, you know, their direct contact at ESPN and then, like, two other levels of corporate. And then finally, once ESPN approves it, because this um, deals with somebody from the SEC, which is the Southeastern Conference, the SEC has to approve it, right? So it just becomes, like, you have to... To actually do the film three times so what the filmmakers do is they i did the first round of edits and they had to do multiple rounds of edits since then and they just waited till the film was locked and then i spent this past week uh cleaning up all the edits and then what i have to do was take the f it's the film is in four acts and so i had to create a pro tool session i had to take each cue and let's say I've got 40 or 50 tracks in each queue. I had to render that down into stem mixes, which, you know, that all gets reduced down to like anywhere between four and eight stereo tracks because, and I do a really good mix. And then I had to line all of the cues up on the timeline, you know, with like the, each group of tracks, color code them, make sure that they were in the right spot to, on the timeline create that session and then I had to do that for all four acts edit stem stem it out mix it import it into a fresh timeline where I've got the whole act uh, which would have been typically probably hundreds of tracks right rendered down into like maybe if there's seven or eight cues per act 35 40 tracks which you know breaks down to between four and eight tracks per each queue. So that that's, it's just it's very time consuming. So I will get to all late assignments. I'll have time this week coming up after tomorrow. Okay, so um, let's go back here. And let's get out our calendar. Okay, so this is today. We have no class next week, from what I understand. We have a class on the 27th, and we've got a class on the 4th, the 11th. That's the last day of class, is the 11th of April. For us, the last day of class for the semester is on the 17th. So the 18th is when, if I were going to give a final, that's when I would give it. But that's just going to be when the, your project is due. So that's five weeks from today, I believe. Let's see. So one, two, three, four, five, we uh, five weeks, right? So one, two, three, four, five, right? And then let's let's take a look at the uh, PDF I've got, which is up on on OneDrive. And I'll pop this in the chat as well. All right, so this is the timeline. First draft is going to be due on the 5th of May. Second draft is going to be due on the 11th of May. And the final project is going to be due on the 18th. I typically only 
do one draft, but I'm feeling like um, because we're online, there's probably going to be some issues with recording live instruments and doing everything like that, that uh, a second draft will be good. And then you can just click on this and it will take you right to the folder that it's due. Okay, so using all the techniques we've learned in class and more that we will learn over the next few weeks, create a composition that is a combination of MIDI and recorded audio tracks. Now, this can be original piece of music or it can be an arrangement of another song. Okay, so if you've got a song, just if, you, if you're going to do a song and, you, and you're somebody who sings, just make sure the lyrics are PG. You know, I don't, don't, don't be cursing and stuff like that. All right. I don't, I don't want to suppress your freedom of speech, but let's, you know, I don't want to hear curse words either. Okay. So key points, stuff that we've been going over so session hierarchy. You'll have the session folder, session file hierarchy with associated subfolders with content needed to run the session. That needs, that means all your audio files have to be inside of the proper folder inside of the session folder. And I'll go over that more, but we've gone over that. Track organization, tracks organized in a logical order, all labeled and color-coded. All clips within a track should have a name associated with the track header. So I'm still getting tracks where you've got the header of the track named correctly, but the clip has a different name to it. So the, all these clips have to have a name, even if there's a, like a few clips because you've recorded in a few different spots, they all have to have the, the, uh, the basic name of the track in there. And that's done by naming the track first before you start recording. Oops, where did I go? Here we go. Right, can be original or cover song. If it's a cover song and you're going to sing, please keep the material PG. Basic treatments. You can have you we're gonna do drum programming, which we've gone over with boom a little bit. MIDI editing, audio editing, we've gone over all that. EQ, compression, and time-based effects. We're, we've started working on this and we're gonna go over this today as needed. Set your levels as we have gone over in class so that the loudest peaks are close to minus six dB using that EQ three. Seven. We've gone over that in a master track. But again, we'll we'll be going over all this stuff again. All right? And more. Deliverables, undergrads, a two to two and a half minute long piece for four or five MIDI instruments and two or three audio tracks. Graduate students, a three to three and a half minute long piece for seven or eight MIDI tracks and three or four MIDI tracks. You'll deliver everything in a zip folder of, for the entire session, and you'll also bounce an MP3. And I'll, I'll review that a few times, and I'll show you the file hierarchy for that. So let me pop this into the... It's up on OneDrive, but let me pop it into the chat uh, just so that it, you have an easy access to it. Uh, whoops, let me change this. Hold on. All right, so that's going to be the final. Got five weeks. We're, we're, I'm going to spend time starting in the next class. You know, we'll spend, I'll spend the whole class showing you how, different ways of recording audio. I've showed you a little bit, but maybe I'll create a track in front of you and, you know, do a combination of MIDI tracks and uh, how I record audio. Now, just one thing about recording audio tracks. If you have a three-minute piece, it doesn't have to be at one audio track that plays continuously for three minutes, right? You're making an arrangement. So if in the chorus you want to do hand claps, you can do that, right? Um, if you don't play an instrument really well enough to record it, get a poem. Recite, a, Make an accompaniment and recite a poem to it. Record yourself speaking. The pool players, they were seven at the Golden Shovel. We real cool, we quit school, we lurk late, we strike straight, we sing sin, we thin gin, we jazz June, we die soon. A poem by Gwendolyn Brooks, right? So you could take that and stretch it out over three minutes and 
make a like a you know like a beatnik uh, you know accompaniment. Uh, there's a a really funny a funny movie with Mike Myers where he lives in San Francisco and he's a beat poet and he's got like a really swinging jazz trio that a quartet that accompanies him and he's reciting all this great. I forget what the name of it is. It was one of his first movies before he became um, Austin Powers. Anyway. Uh, so, you know, if you've got a problem with trying to find out what you should be recording, well, that's one one thing that you can do is you can, you know, do some dialogue. Uh, you can do uh, hand claps. You can, um, you, can, uh, you can make a percussion instrument from a, like a, a pill bottle, like with aspirin in it. Right. There's all sorts of stuff you can do. And we'll, we'll go over some strategies for that. Uh, hopefully, though, you all have access to an acoustic instrument, but I know that some of you probably don't. So we'll go over strategies for get, getting that done. OK, so we're going to talk about uh, for the rest of the class. We're going to talk about three. Three things. We're going to talk about EQ compression, and time-based effects. Time-based effects are... Shoot. Okay, so let me say that again. We're going to talk about uh, three things for the rest of the class, right? That, that would be EQ, uh, EQ compression, and time-based effects. Time-based effects are things like reverb, and echo because they add a temporal spatial element to your mix. Now, one of the things that I stress as far as mixing goes is that a, this, a big part of having a good mix has to do with balancing volumes. And there are volumes can be thought of in multiple ways, right? How loud an instrument is, how loud your overall track is. Focus. What's the focus instrument and how loud is it relative to the rest of the track? In other words, how loud is the melody and what is playing the melody because that might change from section to section. How loud is the bass drum and the kick drum? If you've got a harmony, how loud is the melody note compared to the harmony note? There's all of these volume considerations. How loud is the instrument panned in the center or is it louder panned in the right or the left? You know, those are all volume considerations. There's also, if you take a look at an individual instrument, that individual instrument is comprised of a fundamental tone and a series of harmonics that are mostly above the fundamental tone. And if you've got multiple instruments playing at the same time, there are occasions where harmonics in one instrument may be clashing with the harmonics in another instrument. So how do you balance out the volumes of those harmonics? So volume ha is a multi-level um, event, you know, multi-level uh, activity in your track, right? So what do I mean by that? Okay, let's. I'm going to start working on, this is a little track I put together before, and we'll just take a quick listen. It's only eight bars. Fix 
set. Okay. So basically, we've got a drum set, a bass, we've got electric piano, we've got a rhythm guitar, and a melody guitar. So let's take a listen to the drum kit. So I'm going to highlight these three tracks, these are my drums, and I'm going to make them the same color. Right? And I'm going to solo them. Now, there's another thing that you can do. And this is a little bit more advanced, but this might be helpful to some of you. So I've got a drum kit that's in on three instruments, right? Hi-hats are on the top, this track here. I've got my snare drum or my cross stick here and my kick drum here. So I've got these three instruments. If I select all three of those, so if I click on this one, hold the shift key down and click on the top one, I can group these together with command G and I can call this drums. And if we look here, right, I typed in drums up here, that's the name, and what's currently in the group is the hats, the cross stick, and the kick drum. N these are all tracks that are available I could add to there, but this is, this is what I want. So I'm gonna click OK. And then if we look over here, down in this area here, you can see I've got a group called drums, and you can see it's highlighted. So if I option click here, you'll see that there's a little dot right here. That means it's active. So if I click here, the dot goes away. And if I also option click there, that also gets unhighlighted. So it's not selected. But what I can now do is I can highlight this bottom track. I can do, I'm going to teach you a new track today. Command, Shift, and the letter N like Nancy. And we're going to do a what's called a VCA master. And I'm going to call this drums VCA. Now, VCA means a voltage-controlled amplifier, and it's basically like a, a fader or a volume control for a group of instruments that you assign it to. Right? It doesn't have audio going through it. It just controls the audio, the volume of these other tracks. So what you have to do is you have drums VCA, and then you select a group, and I'm going to select drums. So now if I play this track and I hit S on the VCA, everything is soloed. Right? So let me show you something. I'm going to open up the mix window, which we don't really deal with in this class, but just to show you uh, what, I, what the VCA does. So this is the drums VCA, and these are the three drum tracks right here. So let me zoom in on that so you could see it a little better. Let me get that right in the middle. All right, so this is the VCA, and these three are my drum tracks. So when I pull this fader down, you're going to see these faders also move. So it controls the volume of all these faders. So if I go down, see that, how they all move down? And if I option click on this, everything will get set back to zero. Now, if I bring this one down to five, right, and I bring this down, it will keep the relationship of all of these faders, to bring them all, see how it doesn't, they're not all the same. This one is still softer. So it's, it's a really good way to um, deal with a bunch of tracks that you want as a group, like a, a drum kit. Okay, so let's take a listen. So those are my hi-hats. That's my cross stick, and you'll hear that there's a little bleed in there of the kick drum, right? That's because on this drum set, the kick drum mic, the kick drum is being picked up by the snare mic. Now, there's a couple of thoughts to this, right? You could be of the mind that all that bleed glues the drum kit together. And that's a valid thought. That's absolutely true. Um, some of the greatest drum recordings of all time were just using one microphone. 
on, on the Beatles' first album, Ringo had a microphone above his head to record his entire drum kit. You can hear everything. A lot of great drum tracks in the 70s were recorded with uh, a, a pair of overhead microphones and a microphone on the kick drum so that you could get a little bit more point on the kick and the whole drum set would be picked up by the overhead. Nowadays, a lot of what you hear with real drums, there's a, a microphone on every drum. There's also overheads. And typically what happens is that you get the sound of the drums from the overhead and then bring up the other drums to taste, to fill out and to make a nice point to the sound. And you will oftentimes find that there's not that much isolation between the different microphones. They're picking up different instruments. That's just the nature of microphones. So there's a way to r fix that, right? So let's fix that so that, let, let's just say for our purposes, we don't want to have that bleed because we're going to see about making that cross stick a little bit beefier. So you could see here the audio waves. This is the kick drum. You see the ones that match up in the cross stick. Right, so I can, I can just quickly just do this. You know, just I'm matching these above here, and I'm just highlighting with slip mode and deleting. Oops, I made a mistake. So I just need to get that one track. So you see how I'm doing this? I'm just I'm getting it approximate. It'll be fine. I'm just, these are the kick drums and they're duplicated on this track. So I'm just going to get rid of them. Like I said, this is an exercise to teach you guys uh, a little bit of something. All right, I'm just getting rid of being. Uh, see, this one's a little tricky. Oops. Sorry about that. Okay, so now I've got just a cross stick in here. So let's take a listen to this. Right, there's no kick drum anymore. So that's isolated. Now, the other thing that you can do, what I would do with this, is I would just just clean up the ins and outs. So I'm going to hold, cl click on this one, and then double-click on the very last one, and then the, all of them are selected. And as long as you've got, whoops, excuse me, as long as you have your key focus turned on up here, which some of you still don't have, right, the A and the Z up in the right, upper right-hand corner, most of you have it, this has to be amber, in order for this next bit to work. If I just hit the letter F, it'll just put a little cross, a little fade in on each one of those. You see it, there's a little fade in right there. And that'll just, in case there's a click, it will, it'll take care of that. Okay. And let's listen to our hi-hats. Now, this is something that's really important that I want to explain to you. So the hi-hats were recorded as a stereo track, right? I want to make them so that they're on the right side of uh, the, the, my, my mix, so that they're more like um, I'm watching a drummer. So very simply, I'll hold the option key down and I'm going to click on this and you see that becomes zero and this is still 100% to the right. And that's further to the right now. That's too much. You know, you don't want it to be so far over to the right. So I find that works really well. So this is our drum set now. Let's see, where are we? Here we go. Okay, so I'm going to show you something about hi-hats, right? Let's do this. Let me add my master track. Let me get rid of this. There's a lot of extra tracks in this. Let's get rid of them. We don't need them, so I'm going to highlight and highlight. 
and delete. And then I'm going to do Command Shift N, one new stereo master fader. And um, I have a plugin that you guys won't, don't have, but I'm going to use it to make a point. Uh, let's do this. I have my EQ 3 7 band at the end, so I make sure that um, everything is at the right volume. But uh, before that, I'm going to put in something called um, a, freq an an a frequency analyzer, right? Now, I've just, uh, let's see, let me solo the hi-hats, right? The hi-hats sound like they're high-pitched, right? But you're going to see that there's a lot of activity down here, right? So we don't need that activity because that can, if this is a thicker track, that might create artifacts and clash with the harmonics in another instrument. So uh, let me leave this open, okay? And let me move it to the side. And then I'm going to, in the insert, I'm going to put what's called the EQ1, EQ3 one band EQ. And we went over this a little bit last week. And there are two modes on this EQ that we're going to use. One is called high pass, which is this right here. And one is called low pass. They do exactly what the name says. Low pass allows low frequencies to pass and it attenuates high frequencies. High pass allows high frequencies to pass and attenuates low frequencies. So what we want to do is attenuate these low frequencies here. So I'm going to pull this back like this is my frequency control and this is the slope, how steep the slope is. So I'm going to make it really steep just to show you and I'm going to play the hi-hats and I'm going to sweep this from these low frequencies Right, you can also click and drag all the way to the right, and you'll see that the, the graph will this will change. So let's reset this. And now we'll drag it. And you see the yellow line. Now, let's take a listen to where the sound perceptibly changes. Right? Where so in other words, when I've got it here. And I bypass this. That still sounds like the hi hats, even though I'm cutting off some of these low frequencies. I'm going to sweep it, and you're going to hear a point where the timbre of the hi hat perceptibly changes. And you want to stop for this kind of application. You want to stop just before that. So I'll clear my memory. See how it's thin now? Right. bypass that's close it's a little different but it, it sounds good so I can make that a little less dramatic by changing the slope by on this here and then I might be able to go up a little higher Okay, so that clears up some low end, which is nice. Now, if I solo the cross stick, you're going to see that the cross stick has all of these frequencies here. And let's look at the bass drum. See, it has all those frequencies there as well, right? So what you want to do is make a choice because you got to realize that what we're doing is we're subtract e equalization. There's several modes to equalization. What we're doing right now is called subtractive EQ. We're taking frequencies out. We're reducing the volume of, free, of, of harmonic content in a recording, right? So EQ is frequency dependent volume control. That's the way I think of it or harmonic dependent volume control. You are changing the volume of a certain area of harmonics in a tone or in a mix, or you're changing the volume of a certain frequencies, of certain frequencies, sorry. 
so that when we were looking at the hi-hat, all those frequencies below, I think it was 350 hertz, were attenuated. We brought the volume of them down. They were unnecessary. And this is another concept that when you have a sound that is isolated, that's one thing. To, in order to make it fit into the mix, you might do certain things to that sound that you wouldn't do if it was solo. If I was recording an acoustic guitar for a solo performance, I'd have all the frequencies. If I was strumming an acoustic guitar and there was a bass and a bass drum and, a, and keyboards, I would attenuate all the low frequencies so that the lower strings were softer. And what we got was the, the, the parts that have the most benefit to the mix. In other words, the parts where your strumming um, goes, the strumming part and the higher harmonics there cut through and they don't clash with the lower pitched instruments, the left hand of the piano, the kick drum, the bass guitar. So that's in a mix. So if you were to listen to that solo, it might sound a little thin, but inside the mix, it works really well. And it adds clarity because you don't have all this volume of frequencies that are close, but not exactly the same in the same area fighting to be heard. So that when you are using a low pass or a high pass filter and you're attenuating, doing subtractive EQ, you're turning the volume down of the frequencies in that area. And that is also turning down the volume of the track. Because there's less volume, less harmonics coming through, right? You're turning the volume of those harmonics down. All right. So that's like a tricky concept, but that's pretty much the best way that I can... Um, the best way that I can uh, explain it to you. So let's go back to the cross stick. All right, so we've got all of this stuff here that we don't need, right? And you, you again, you don't have this uh, this particular plugin, but this is for examples. You're gonna. That's why I'm sh showing you with your ear. So I just drag this down here, and I'm gonna do again. I'm gonna play it. And now you see it's very thin. Whoops. And with this one, I think I'm going to do a, you know, I'm going to use this, this cue here. And I'm going to make it very dramatic, right? So that we get rid of all those lower frequencies. Let me clear the memory. Right? And if I bypass it, it's not going to sound much different. See, it's bypassed. It's a little thinner, but we're not going to miss that because those low frequencies are going to get in the way of the kick drum. Okay. Now... I don't know if you can hear this over Zoom, but there's a ring in the kick drum. I'm going to close this for now. A very high frequent, a high pitched ring. Bing. Bing. I'd like to bring the volume of that down because that's going to get in the way of the electric piano. I know that. I just know that. So this time I'm going to use the EQ7, uh, EQ37 band. So let's take a look at this uh, fancy plugin. So, you know, this is a good plugin. It comes with Pro Tools. Um, it, what's nice about this is that it's very transparent and, and it works well. I, I still use this and I still use the one band EQ, even though I've got very fancy, very expensive uh, plugins. But I still use um, these because they work. Okay, so it has an input and an output meter, and we're going to do something called volume matching. And volume matching, and it's got the controls for the input and the output. And what volume matching does is it makes sure that the same volume that is in the input 
is equal to what's coming out of it after you've done with your treatment. So this also has a high pass and a low pass filter right in this section here. And you could turn it on and it's very similar to what we had in the other one. You could turn it off and the high pass, the low pass filter, you know, the same thing as in the one band, but we're not going to use those here right now. And then it's color coordinated. So from left to right is low, the controls for the low frequencies and controls for the higher frequencies. If you'll notice this graph, lower to higher. And whenever you see one of these frequency graphs, it's always left to right is low to high, and bottom to top is soft to loud. So it's like a piano, left to right. The low notes are on the left, the high notes are on the right. And at the bottom is the softest notes, and at the top is the, the loudest volume. So this is red. This is also red. This is orange or amber. This is amber, yellow. This one is yellow, green, and blue. So if I change the volume on this red one, you'll see that the red dot goes up and it, it increases the volume of the lower frequencies. So let's see how that works with the kick drum. So let me just solo the kick drum because that's what we're working with. And let's, again, if you want to zero this out, you just hit option and click. And then you can hear a lot more low end, right? You're also seeing that I'm just going into the red and I'm going into the red here. Now, you'll notice that I've added, that's because I've added 12 dB of volume for everything below 50 hertz. And, you know, starting up here around 200 hertz, uh, there's more volume being added to all those low notes. So if I turn this off, it gets even. So right there's on off buttons here too. So that's that area. Let's play around with this area and see what we get. That's adding sort of more punch, right? To the sound. Let's look at this area here and listen to what that sounds like. That gives you a little bit of the snap from the drum. And let's do this one, which is just a little bit higher. And right there, I can start hearing that funky sound. We'll go back to that in a minute. And this is the highest frequencies here. Right? And that gives you sort of like a really, like a clicky snap. Now, I want to find that ring, right? And I want to reduce the volume of that. So what I want to do first is exaggerate it. So we need to learn a little bit more about these controls here. Okay, so you'll notice that if you look at this row uh, uh, right here, that's the same on each. Each row is the same on each one of these five controls. The bottom one is gain. The middle one is the frequency corresponding to where this dot is on the frequency spectrum here. It's got an on-off switch. And then it's got something here called Q. Q is not a wacky conspiracy theory, nor is it a, a, a bizarre, super uh, powerful alien entity on Star Trek and nor is it one of the greatest producers of all time. Q is the shape of the, the EQ. Let me show you what I mean by that. I'm going to take this uh, yellow one right here, and I'm going to turn the gain up, right? And you'll notice that the Q is set to 1. Whoops. Let me put that back to one. And this is the shape of the Q. That means that all these frequencies, it looks like a bridge, right? Start to gradually increase until you get to the peak, which is right at uh, 1,000 hertz, and then it slopes off. If I bring the Q up, you'll see that this will become a sharper curve, a tighter, like a hairpin, it'll start looking like, right? 
And that means that it's not really affecting these frequencies here. It's getting more involved in honing in just a few frequencies. And again, you can go below one and you'll see that everything is affected, right? That looks like another bridge. So let's go back to zero. So to, to find the problem frequency, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the cue very tight and I'm going to bring the volume way up, just like this, right? And then I'm going to slowly slide it from left to right and I'm going to listen as I play. I'm going to listen for that ring that I don't like. So you see right there, there's a, that's a harmonic. You can hear it's going up. Sometimes it's in tune with the fundamental of the kick drum, and sometimes it's out. So that's almost an octave or two octaves. It's right above that. And I'm going to bring that down. And I'm just going to gently back the cue off a little bit. And then that's way too much. I'm just going to make it very gentle. And for me, it's gotten rid of that little, that little ring. So that sounds better to me already. I made a mistake here. Yes, I got rid of one. Oops. <laughs> okay, so there's a there's a bit right here. Right? Where it it fades off too quickly. So I'm going to snap this off right here. In other words, there's a kick drum right after this. You see that right there and if I go like this, it it Well, that's not bad. I'm going to leave that. Okay, that's fine. Right, it almost, you can hear it almost cutting off right after that kick drum, which, whereas these other ones sort of fade out more naturally. We're going to, I'm going to, I'm going to address that later on. I'm going to mask that with adding reverb, but that's fine for now. Okay, so now, I like the way the drum kit sounds. I can hear every instrument. Now, what next thing I want to do is I want to go to my uh, EQ3. Okay, so now if I look at this, just my drums alone are getting me up to minus six. Not good. So... For this right now, I could bring, you know, all of the gain, clip gain down, but that this that sounds fine. I'm going to take this, my VCA master, and I'm going to bring this down 4 dB, which will give me a little bit of playing room. Let's get that. Uh... You see, so now I'm at minus 10. So that gives me six, 4 or 5 dB to play around with while I add these other instruments in. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add the bass. So I'll just solo that in. Okay, listen and tell me, is the bass too soft, too loud, or just right? Anybody venture a guess? A little loud. 
It's a little loud. So, so William, it should be softer. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yep, that's exactly right. It's way too loud. It's covering up the kick drum. Yeah, exactly. It overcomes the drums. Good, William. Excellent. All right. So let's bring the volume down. We're going to do clip-based game because it's also bringing our volume here up way too hot. So if we go here to our seven band, let me just keep this open. So to keep this open while you're working, right, this is the target mode. Just click right there and then it'll stay open. So let's just do this. So if I play all these, you see that I'm back over six again, right? So that's adding way too much gain. So I'm going to drag it down here. I'm just going to listen. So that sounds better, right? But now I have to make a decision. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to solo the kick drum and the bass. I'm going to listen to the two of them together. Now, this is something that's incredibly tricky and not easy to get or to effectuate. But you, you have to, when you're mixing music that has a, a rhythm section like this, where there's a kick drum and a bass that's, that are entwined together, you can s listen to them that they're locked in. The kick drum is accenting the notes that the bass is playing, and then the bass is just doing little fills. What do you want each one to do? Do you want the kick drum to give you the fullness and the low end? Or do you want the bass guitar to do that? That's a choice that you have to learn how to make. So let's play around with each example and see which one feels better. So I've got, I'm going to take the bass and I'm going to put in EQ3. And I'm going to do that same thing that I did before. Let's just do it without the kick drum first. And I'm going to go into this area, the orange area here. All right. And I'm going to turn off the red dot here, just like that. And the reason for that is that I like the shape. This has different shapes and it won't give us the curve that we want. It'll just be, it's almost like a, a low pass filter. Um, so I'm going to leave this on and I'm going to make my cue pretty tight. And I'm going to play that and I'm going to bring up the volume. Right, you see I'm adding all that fullness around 100. If I go down here, you can't really hear it. Let me bypass it. See, it's thin. Much warmer now and fuller. Right? So that's way too much. So I'm going to bring it to, I'm leaving it there. So now it's actually lower than I thought it was. It's about 68. And then I'm going to back off, right, the Q and bypass. See, thin, full. And it's not this. That's ridiculous. All right, let's listen to that with the drum kit. So now the other thing is we want a volume match, right? So if we look at the input and the output, you'll see that there are two different numbers. See the output is higher than the input. So we take the output and we bring it down until they both match. See how now they're both the same? And 
that's volume matching in a nutshell. So let's listen to this with drum. So the kick, the bass is a little too loud still. But I also think that the kick drum is a little thin also. So, because I, I don't have anything else down there, I'm going to just take this and bring this up a little bit. I could, if the low end gets a little bit too man unmanageable, I could alternatively, um, I could turn on this low pass filter and just get rid of some of the sub harmonics. I could always do that. Now let's volume match. Now, I'm going to turn these on and off, and you'll hear the difference in the sound. See how thin that is? Turn them back on. All right. So that sounded pretty good. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to listen to the electric piano. Now, I've got that panned in the center, right? What I can do is I can pan that over to the right a little bit. Let me see what the frequency of the electric piano is. I think it sounds good. We just might do a little high pass filter. Yeah, just to get rid of some of these little guys down here. They're not very loud, so I'm just going to literally just focus down way at the very bottom. We don't really need those. And they, now they won't bother the bass or the kick drum. Okay, so now that's okay. It's dry. And... You know, it doesn't really do anything for me. So there's a couple of solutions. So I let me just take a look into the Air plugins, Air Music Technology. Doesn't have what I'm looking for. All right. So now... There are multiple kinds of time-based effects, and this is what I'd like for you to do um, for our assignments. There are multiple ways to play this out. Echo or delay and reverb, we're going to do that with a send or an aug into an augs track. But for things like that, that are tight delays, that have to do with a little bit with pitch cha changing, like chorusing, phasing, flanging, all that stuff. We're going to insert that into the track. I sometimes have those on ascend because I want to do additional pl playing around with them. But I think that's a good way to organize to get started is that things like phasing, flanging, and ensemble patches, you plug right into the insert. And echo slash delay and reverb are on sends. So let's take a look at this chorusing phasing thing, right? So if we go into the air music technology, which you guys should all have, it's got air chorus, air ensemble, air flanger, air multi-chorus, air phaser. 
So these are very quick delays with basically there's, there's a, there's a, I could <clears throat> go into detailed explanation of all of them, but they're very tight echo with some sort of pitch shifting or modulation that creates two sounds that are a little bit out of phase with each other. And you get a really, it's a thickening of the sound. So let's listen to the different ones. So let's try air chorus. All right. Now, one thing about this is <clears throat> it's got all these controls. This is your most important control, the mix. You don't want to have it be at 100%. You want to have it just so that enough so that you can hear the effect. And you can look at, there's a bunch of presets, right? So let's look at a soft mono chorus because we've only got a, I want to keep this panned. All right. So we'll do slow mono. Did I plug that into the right spot? Yes, I did. Right, it's not even, It's you don't even hear it. So let's see. How about slow mono? There you go. You can start hearing the sound there, changes. This was big for electric pianos in the late uh, 70s into the 80s. Bring down the mix. So let me take show you these controls here, right? So this is the uh, de this is the rate and the depth of the waveform that is modulating the original audio file. So this is a triangle wave, right? So if I turn the depth up, you're going to hear like much more of a wobble. And if I bring the rate up, and if I turn it to a sine wave, it'll be a different sound. Right? So you, you play around with these to get it to sound the way you'd like. I might want a little more depth. Now, feedback is the number of echoes, right? So if I turn the feedback up, Even that, wow, 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 wow. That's because there's a lot of de delays all happening in sequential five millisecond intervals and all intersecting at different times. And then the pre-delay is how long it takes until the effect starts. Right, so... Now, if you turn the mix up all the way, you're, you're not going to hear anything. Except the, right, you're only hearing the affected signal. So you're hearing that, all that pitch shifting. So that's why the mix, you'll get the re original signal being mixed in with the effect. So that sounds pretty nice. Let's hear that inside the track. I'm going to mute the two guitar tracks for the time being. I like that. That gives me a little sense of movement. Now, it's still very dry. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to go to the bottom guitar track. I'm going to highlight that, and I'm going to do Command-Shift-N, and I'm going to add two stereo AUGS inputs. And I'm going to color code these with I typically make these no color and I'm going to name these the top one I'll name reverb and the bottom one I'll name delay now let me show you how to set these up so the first thing I'm going to do something here and Casey let me know if this helps you out all right she had a question before that she sent so if I go to the setup and I go to IO and I hit default on the bus, default on the output, and default on the input. Okay? Now, if 
if you have, I think she was saying that right here there was no input, no output. Is that correct? Casey? You can always select the output this way. Just click there and select the output. But we want to select our input. So we're going to click here and go to bus, and we're going to select bus 1, 2, or the first available one, and we'll do the same thing for this one. Notice how bus 1, 2 is now amber because it's been selected. We'll select bus 3 and 4. And we went over this a little bit last week with uh, that whole thing with the telephone operators and the switchboards. Is that correct? Did I go over that with you guys about busing, or is that an audio MIDI one? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So a bus, busing doesn't refer to like a, a school bus or a metro bus. It refers to something called a bus bar, which is a metal bar that transfers energy and signals, right? So back in the early days of audio, when they had, you know, when you were calling somebody on the telephone, you had a switchboard operator and they had a big patch board where they would patch in all the different people calling each other. And all those different patch points were connected with, you know, they had bus bars in the back of them. So there you have it. But we just, we just realized that we're, the term is busing. So I've got bus one and two, bus three and four, and then I want to do something to these two tracks called solo safe. I want to make sure that the S here is uh, a, a, not active because this way if I solo the electric piano and I want to do a reverb and the delay effect on it, I will be able to hear those effects. And I'll explain that in a, few, in a couple of minutes when we get to there. But what you want to do is use the command key and click command right on the letter S and you see how it becomes gray it's no longer active, right? So just gray that out. And then you've got your buses one and two and three and four. And if I right click there, I can rename them. So bus one and two, I'm gonna rename reverb. And then bus three and four, I'm gonna rename that delay. And there you have it. That's all set up almost. We need a reverb plugin. So we'll click here and we'll, I'm going to go to Avid and we're going to use in our class, unfortunately, D-verb uh, Avid. D-verb. And then we're going to use uh, we'll go to Avid. Let's see. Mod Delay 3. Mod Delay 3 is fine. D-verb has some decent sounds but they need to upgrade the algorithms and they haven't in years. So we started going over reverb and delay last time, but let's let's do this. So I'd like to give the roads a little bit of left and right space because it's right now it's panned on the right. So I can send a copy of that audio to the um, To, to the reverb channel. And the way we do that is we have to add our sends column back in. Right? So now we've got our sends column. Now, what does the sends column do? So this is, let's say this is your, this is your road. I'm going to do an imaginary thing here. This is your road. This is where your audio starts and it goes through your channel strip, right? And then it comes out it all gets summed to the master bus. I, I showed you that those images with the guitar and all that stuff. So that's, you know, that's that highway. What you can do is you can take something called ascend and you can create a parallel path, right? Where the audio, this is your original audio and you send a copy of that audio to another track and they're parallel and then it goes through the reverb in the second track and they all get blended together at the master at the master output. All right. So what the sends does, and I'll repeat it again, is it enables you to send a copy of the audio to another destination. And that destination that I'm going to choose right now is the reverb track. So we've got our send here. I'm going to click here and I'm going to go to bus and you'll see that because I named those tracks, they're easy to find. Reverb, stereo, and a little fader pops up. And this determines the, um, 
the amount of audio that gets sent from here into the reverb track. It's not, you're not stealing audio from here. It doesn't get softer. You're just sending a copy of that audio, right? It's like you're splitting it off into two, two, two um, tracks. So if I turn this up, you can see there's a lot of, there's reverb. Right? So what we want to do is we want to go down here and let's, oh, I got it up too much right now because I want to adjust the reverb. So we went over this a little bit last year, last week. And what you can do is these up here, the, the ones that we're going to deal with are the hall, the church, the plate, and both of the rooms. Don't worry about ambient and nonlinear. This is, this is plenty of stuff for just starting out. This is the gain. It should always be at zero dB. It gives you three settings. So right now I've got set for hall, like a concert hall, large, medium. You see the de decay goes, to it goes down. Church is much bigger, medium, small, plate, and two rooms. Right, they have the same, whoops. Hey. Right. They have similar sizes, but they, I guess they probably have different sounds to them. So you can play around here, but you can also look here and you've got a bunch of presets, which are good starting points. So I'm going to do a bright plate. I do think the plates on this plugin sound good. And I'm going to turn the gain all the way up. And I like that. It's too much. I'm going to turn it down. And now you can hear that the, the, the dry sound is on the right, and there is some of the dry the reverb is on the right also, but there's also re, the reverb is stereo. So you're going to hear some of the wet sound on the left. So that gives you, right, when I stop it, you can hear all of a sudden there's more sound coming out of your left ear if you're listening on. Right, so you, that's making it wider spatially. You know, you're making the sound wider. You've got the, the sound on your uh, on your right, which my right, and you're adding a quieter, more spacious sound on the left, like it's bouncing off a wall somewhere. And then that's making the sound a little more stereo. There are other ways to make a mono sound stereo. This is one of them. So let's listen to how that sounds in the track. I think there's a little bit too much reverb. I can hear it overpowering it. So I'm going to bring it down to about 10. Now, the cross stick is a little dry. So I'm going to use the same reverb and I'm going to add some to the cross stick. Right, that's way too wet, but I just want you to hear that. Let me back it off. So the bass is still too loud. I'm just going to bring the volume down here. So you see, I'm always making adjustments as I'm listening, right? It's, a, it's, it's like, a, it's like, it's like a, a slab of clay on a, on a wheel. You know, you're, you're shaping it, you're shaping it, and then, you know, some, you make a nice shape, and then it affects something else there, so you got to adjust that, and it's, you know, that's kind of like uh, mixing, or if you're making a soup, and you put some spice in, and you taste it, oh, that spice needs to be counteracted, because it's a little too much, it, that, that's sort of what mixing is, you're just, you're, you're constantly adjusting as you go along, because there's other things I'm hearing in the roads that I don't like, but I want to hear how it fits in with the with the guitar there's it's a little bit too much in the mid-range and it's clashing with the bass still a little bit for my ears and then i might add a little bit of reverb to the um hi-hats and notice i did option click drag and so 
So if I solo the hat, well, let's say I solo the cross stick, right? You could still hear the reverb. Now, if I unsolo safe this, you don't hear the reverb anymore. That's why you solo safe it, so that you can hear the reverb even when this instrument is soloed. See that how that's too much? It loses the definition. Cool. All right. So let me, I'm going to, before I get to the guitar, I think, I'm going to solo the, the bass and the uh, Rhodes. I'm going to need to do a little EQ work. So I'm going to do it before the chorus. So I'm going to, not the chorus of the song, but before the air chorus. I'm going to drag this down like this. Actually, uh, I'm going to go over the other, the phase, the ensemble, the flanging, but let's just leave this here. It, I'm going to add in my EQ7, because so you can stack EQs. There's not a problem with that. And up in this area here, let me go into this mid-range here, and I'm going to make my Q high, and I'm going to turn off these other bands so that I, I'm not interrupted. <laughs> and I'm going to bring my depth up. You hear that? You hear that? That's bothering me. So, you know, it, like, I can hear that. I don't expect any of you to be able to hear that, but eventually if you work at this, you will, you know, it's like, you know, when you first start ear training as a music student, you can't, you can't sing a major third after you do it for a few weeks or a few months, you can sing a major third, right? Side singing. It's the same thing with this. The more you do it, the more sensitive that your ears get to these things. And notice I'm, that's bothering me because it's, it's, not in, in isolation, it doesn't bother me. It's bothering me because it's playing, it's messing around with the bass. So, um, yeah. Okay, so I'll bring this down. And I'll, that's too much. Now, if we look here, the output is softer because we subtracted volume. So I'm going to bring my output up to volume match. That's looking pretty good. Okay, let's listen to all this again. See, for me, the electric piano sounds so much better now. Let me mute that seven band. See, it's muddy now. Put, put this back in with this out in. You can hear more of the bells in the electric piano. All right, so I've got this guitar here. So I'm gonna move this over to the left because the piano's on the right. And I'm gonna bring the volume down here to blend it in. Adjust the panning. Now, I, there's not a lot of EQing I'm going to do to that. What I'm going to do, though, is I'm, I am going to chop off a lot of the low end in case there's any in there. Okay, so I'm going to do a couple of things to this, right? Right. 
So notice it's dry. It's so dry it sticks out. So we're going to play around with that a little bit. Let me solo this and let me go to adding some of the, let's go to our delay. And we may add delay and reverb and we may do a few other things to this. So we have our mod delay here, right? Now, the mod delay is stereo. Okay? That means that it has a delay for the left and a delay for the right. And it has your gain for both of those over here. Now, I can link these so that whatever I do on the right is matched on the left, or I could unlink these. So what if I didn't want any delay on the left because that's where the guitar is, but what if I wanted there to be an echo on the right? Do you remember when we went over the Steely Dan, right? The, there was the guitar was on, uh, the, the, the clavinet was on the right, and then the delay for the clavinet was on the left, right? How, how they did that, or the vocals were in the center and the, the reverb for the vocals were on the, on the right. So this is, this, is just, this is just what these guys do, and you study the stuff, and this is now I'm adapting that technique to this. I'm going to see what that sounds like. It might not work, but this is going to be my starting point. So I'm going to just, there's another way of doing this where I could have just pulled out a mono augs track, but I'm not sure this is going to work and I want to keep my options for stereo open. So I'm, this is not linked, so I can bring down the volume on my left side so that there is no delay, there's no output on the left side of this track. And I can now play around with the right side. So I... This is synchronized. So what if I make an eighth note delay? Let's see what that sounds like. So I'm adding to the rhythm. So now, right, if I want more echoes, I can turn the feedback up. That's too much. It gets too busy. Now, what if I change that to a dotted eighth note rhythm? That's kind of cool, you know? So you play around with this. I could do a quarter note rhythm. No, I don't like that. What if I did a 16th note rhythm? That could work in some circumstances. But I like that dotted eighth. Now, it's a little, still a little dry, so I'm going to take the bus and I'm going to send it a second one to the reverb. Now again, too much. Good for dubstep. Okay, so there's one other thing I want to do here is I want to uh, do some compression, okay? So what is compression? So at this point, I'm going to uh, talk about compression. We're going to go over compression more after the break, all right? But this is just like a little introduction to it. In the old days, like even older than me, <laughs> um, when somebody was recording something in the studio, they would have their hands on the faders and they would sort of do a performance. So if they knew something was going to get really loud, they would turn the volume on the fader down so it would be so recorded a little bit softer and not overload the machines. And so after a while of doing that, it got, somebody came up with the idea, well, what if there was an electronic automated way where we could control the volume? where we can automatically bring the volume down in the loud spots. 
right? That's basically what compression does. So let's take a look at compression. And we have um, dynamic th Dynam 3 compressor limiter. So that's in your Avid bit. Now, this is a little bit... Now, just, just you know, I'm throwing a lot of stuff out at you today. We're going to go over this again next week, you know, in the next class. This is basically the rest of the semester is going to be about recording audio and mixing the next, you know, the three and a half classes or the three classes after this. So, you know, try to get as much of this as you can. Uh, uh, take some notes for things that might confuse you or that you need a better explanation of because I could always be more articulate. That's not an issue, not a problem for me to, you know, teach you these things multiple times until you get it. And ask me next week, you know. So, yeah. Okay. So, a compressor, there's, there's a few controls here. If we look, go from the left to the right, some of these, some of these controls we're not going to worry about, like the side chain here, we're not worried about that this semester. This is the input. This is the output. Uh, I need a, a drink of water. Hold on. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if I play the tr if I solo the guitar, yeah, it's soloed. Now, the 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 reverb and the delay are not going through here, but you could see the input level here is matched at the output level. This bar here is called GR. That stands for gain reduction or how how much volume you're bringing down the track. So gain reduction. Knee, let's not worry about that for now. You've got attack, release, and ratio, gain, and threshold. So the threshold adjusts the level that triggers the compressor. Right? So now right here, up here is a graphic representation this line is where the threshold is set, and this is the way the compressor is set up by default. And you'll see a little bouncing ball goes past the threshold. If I bring the threshold down, you're seeing that the, this is how much gain reduction is going on. So what's happening is that for every decibel above the threshold, I have the ratio set to 3 to 1. For every 3 decibels above the threshold, it's only allowing 1 decibel of volume to go up. So in other words, for every 3 decibels above the threshold, it's only allowing 1 decibel of volume to go up. So if you go six decibels above the threshold, it's only allowing two decibels to go up. If I have a, a ratio of, Horatio ratio, ratio <laughs> of, uh, and you'll also see see how the, the, the visual changes. So that's a good aid, right? So if you have a ratio of one to one, it doesn't do anything. So notice I'll bring the, the threshold all the way down, nothing, because it's not affecting it. I'll bring the ratio up. And two things. You'll see this goes down, and you'll start to see this, some activity over here. Right. So this is really unmusical. You wouldn't do this. But that's threshold and ratio. Attack is how long until the compressor turns on. So this is really compressed now. Let me back the attack off. Right, so you can hear the, the picking gets goes through and the rest of the track gets turned down. 
as opposed to now, where you can hardly hear anything. So that's what the attack does, and the release is how long until the, the, the compression stops. So that's a little bit more complex. But for right now, we're going to go back. I'm going to option click everything back to the original state. And we're, that's a nice three to one. And maybe we'll turn the attack up a little bit so that we let our pick picking come through. But the rest of the sound goes down. So we'll bring our threshold down a little bit. And we're seeing a little bit of compression here, but it's not really changing our input and output volume that much, right? So now it's starting to change it. Now that's we're just gonna back off so that we don't we we see it and we feel it, but we don't really it's not exaggerated for this example. Now, if I turn this threshold way down you'll see that my input and output are not matching. So I would take my gain and make them match. Right, but with this one here that we're doing with just a little bit of compression, they're pretty good. Now, let's listen to that in the track. See, I... I don't know if you remember what it sounded like before, but it fits in so much better now. I'm going to turn off everything, all these effects, right? We'll listen to the guitar. And see how it sticks out like a sore thumb. So we'll add the compressor back in. And you can see it, it tucks it in a little bit. EQ. Delay and some reverb. It just tucks it right in, it fits right in. It's a beautiful thing. Whoops. So we're gonna go over compression in a little bit more detail next week. Like uh, so so don't worry about that. It's, it's just an introduction. So now let's take a look at our uh, our lead guitar. Okay, so it sounds like the, the it sounds like the the amplifier speakers right in, right in your face, right? There's no depth at all. I'll solo that. And listen, right? There's no space. Okay, so what we want to do is um, two things with this. We're going to compress it. I don't know if we're going to change the tone that much and we're going to add some space to it. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to add just a little reverb. I'll solo this. That already is sounding better. So let me add the compressor in and just smooth out the... Um, Oops. Smooth out the signal. There's another compressor that Pro Tools comes with. Uh, we'll, we'll, I'll show you that next week. So I'm bring down my threshold. Bring my volume down just a little. Okay, now a couple of things. When you've got guitar tracks, Guitars have pickups, right? Electric guitars. 
they're either single coil or humbuckers. And if they're single coil guitars, they're suspect to 60 cycle hum. Right? So um, this guitar here, my Strat, has, um, you know, I mean, guitar is my second instrument. I'm a, I'm a doubler. I mean, a keyboard is my main instrument. This has single coil. I went over this, I believe, a little bit before. You know, there's just one line of magnets um, here, and a humbucker would be thicker, a wider uh, pickup. So you get 60 cycle hum from here. And, you know, when, if you're recording somebody, you can... If you change the position, it will change the amount of 60 cycle hum you get. Now, I, I can demonstrate that next week. But there's also something to know about with modern Stratocaster guitars. They're set up so that when you change the pickup position right here with the switch, if you put it in this position, there's five positions. First, like the one, three, and five, and then two and four is both pickups, uh, the back in the middle and the front in the middle. When it's got these both pickups selected, what they do is they reverse wind the coil on maybe the middle one, and they become humbucking, so they get quieter. So that's just something, if you're producing and you've got a guitar player, you want to know that. But typically what I, uh, you do, what I do with, with, guitar, with lead guitar tracks is I go in and I clean up all the space between the notes just to get rid of any hum that might be in there. Just just like this. Just clean it up. This one doesn't because I used the in-between position. I should have done it, made it noisy. But just I clean that up, get rid of all of the and then I do a fade out at the end there. Um, and then I'll select all and just do that F bit I have to do my fade out again. Okay. So it's very quiet in between the notes, and then you're not adding noise to your... Um Okay, so I'm going to go, now I don't like this, so I'm going to fix this. I'm going to delete that whole bit there. like the way those two guitars sound together, so I'm just going to get rid of that bit. Now, the Rhodes fades out abruptly, so I'm going to add a fade out there, and I'm going to listen to my bass note. Now, my bass note has a little click at the end, which I don't like, so let's listen to that. Right here. Boom. You can see it if I change the size of it, right? You can see there's like a little bump there. So I'm going to get rid of that little noise and do a little fade out. Much smoother. down. I'd like to have the hi-hats a little louder, so I'm going to bring those up a little bit. Now, let me show you a couple of things that we can do here to further enhance this. So I've got these hi-hats. They're clean, right? If I want to make them a little edgy, what I can do is there's, if, I, if you go into your Avid, there's something called Sans Amp, which I think I've shown you before. Um, maybe I showed Audio MIDI one, and this is just like a little, like a little guitar amplifier plug-in, right? It's very old tech. It, this this mo the, uh, this is the model of a real piece of gear, 
uh, which I actually own the real piece of gear. And I still use this. This hasn't been updated, but I still use this. So let's listen to that. So this is a little clean too, so I might add some of that to this as well. little drive bring the level back down I don't like it on the hi-hats so I'm gonna leave them alone I actually don't really like the melody guitar that much. <laughs> so I'm going to take that off. I'll hire somebody else to play on it. All right. So that's um, a lot of information about mixing. We went over um, we did, the important things for today are the... Uh, Group. We did a grouping of the drum tracks and we added a VCA master so that we could control the overall level of the entire drum kit and then also solo all those individual instruments. That's very important. I, we went over some basics with EQ. We went over using a high-pass filter to clean out some of the low end. I gave you an introduction to using subtractive EQ where we tried to find the f problematic frequency and we brought that down. We went over this five-band EQ and what all the different sections, where they are. And we also did a little additive uh, EQ with the bass and the bass guitar. We added some of that low frequency to fill out the sound a little bit. We added chorus to wide, to add some motion to the electric piano. And we also added some reverb to make the electric piano be a little bit more spacious left and right, as well as having some depth. And then we did some EQ work with the electric piano because some of the mid-range frequencies were getting involved with the um, with the bass, and they were so we had to clear out some of those. And then we did some delay and reverb and compression EQ and a little crunch on the rhythm guitar, right? And the delay gave us a nice extra rhythm. And then. Um, yeah, we played around with the lead guitar and ultimately I decided that I'd need to have somebody else come in and play that part. <laughs> so we did a lot of stuff today. Now, let me, um, there's a couple more things to do. So let me just go to our, our OneDrive and then, um, right, I didn't put in anything for today. Okay, uh. So um, you guys, you know, if you want to go over this again, I'm not going to uh, look at these until Friday. All right. So if you want you, if you want to continue working on your mix and hand it in tomorrow night, uh, you're more than happy to do that. I'll look at it. Friday. I'm going to start working on all my assignments for both my classes on Friday morning and try to get through everything over the weekend and get all caught up on everything. Spend like, you know, a little bit of time each day rather than one long day. Uh, so, so Casey has it as, uh, can you, she wrote, she couldn't reset the buses and now all of her tracks are blank. So Casey, are you still with us? Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set it so that you can share your screen. Okay. All right. So do you have pro tools open there? Can you do that? I do. Yeah. Um, how do I share my screen? 
So there's, I guess, at the bottom of the Zoom thingy there, there's a, a, you can click on it and you can share the desktop. I don't see anything. I see. Uh, oh, oh, it's green. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. This is good for everybody to take a look at. Sorry, one sec. It's asking for like permission. Oh, really? I just set it so that everybody can do it. Hold on. Multiple. No, I think because on my computer, um, I might have had something. While she's doing that, just so everybody knows, right, your mixes aren't going to sound po as polished as you would like. Just do the best you can. This is like your first time doing these things, right? Just realize that you do, do it now, and if you keep at it, right, over time, you'll get better. My mixes are so are better now than they were even a year ago. I'm, I'm even as I get older, I keep working on it. I mean, I'm, I'm ancient, and I still, you know, I keep working on it. My try to get my mixes better. Um, you, you just keep learning by, by doing it's repetition. You know, if you practice the piano once for an hour and then you come back a year later, you're not going to be any better at the piano. If you practice the piano a half an hour a day for a year, you're going to be significantly better at the piano. If you practice the piano a half an hour once a week for a year, you won't be as good as if you practice the piano 15 minutes a day, every day for a year. And it's the same with mixing and doing this work. You just, you have to do it. Re repetition is key. You know, um, if you, after this class is over, if you don't seek to do any work for a year, you'll forget everything that you've learned.